Hello, 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 everybody out there in podcast land. Welcome to Stat, Shocking Traumas and Treatments, and I am your host, Karen Wickham, coming to you from beautiful Toronto, Ontario, Canada. How are you all doing? Do you answer me in the car or your house or whatever and go, just fine, Karen, or not so good today? You know, I I just always wondered because I don't get that answer back. Anyway, I also want to know how our friends in Texas are doing. You guys have gone through hell and back with a pandemic on top of it all. So I hope things are settling down for you and that you didn't uh, go through uh, too much, um, I don't know, hell. (laughs) So hopefully this episode will help distract even for a little while from uh, that uh, insanity that's going on. Um, I'm excited about telling this story. That's why I've kept it a secret because I wanted to tell you myself, but you probably already know about this guy because you guys are true crime enthusiasts. So, you know what? I just want to get started. Here is the story, the horrific story of Dr. Marcel Petio. The residents of Lesseur Street had noticed smoke exiting from a chimney at 22 Lesseur. It had been burning for five days. The smell was sickly sweet, like that of a pork roast. In fact, the smoke was getting into their homes, through the windows, and the debris and smell was settling onto their furniture. The residents believed that the house was uninhabited. This made the smoke that emanated from the chimney even more peculiar. Sometimes the neighbors would see a man dressed in a long coat and cap enter the property. He was always riding a bike and pulling a canvas-covered cart. Sometimes at night, he was accompanied by a visitor carrying a suitcase. On day five of the smoking chimney, a neighbor went to the home to investigate. And on the door was a note, and it read, Away for a month, forward mail to 18 Rue de Lombard, Auxerre. The neighbor called the police. And when the police arrived, they were unable to enter the apartment. They spoke to the concierge, who informed the police that the house was owned by a Dr. Marcel Petiot. They gave the police his home address at 66 Rue Comartin. This was near a red light district. The police called Dr. Petio's home and spoke to him, and he informed them that he would meet them at his house in 15 minutes. He told them not to touch anything. A small crowd started to gather, wondering what was going on. The police and the smoke and the mysterious owner had piqued their interest. Petio did not show up in 15 minutes. In fact, an hour had gone by. When the police decided to call the fire brigade, the fire department's captain broke into an upstairs window and entered the building with other firefighters. They encountered a nightmare. The smell was ghastly, and they traced its origin to the basement. There were two coal stoves blazing. Hanging out from one of them was a human hand. Scattered around the basement was a pile of human bones, skulls, rib cages, and arms and legs. The stench nauseated them, and some even vomited. The firemen opened the door so that the police could enter. Shocked by what they found, these police called the police headquarters, and the fire chief was approached on the outside of the building by a man who identified himself as Petio's brother Maurice. The chief directed him to one of the other officers. Petio's brother insisted on entering the building to retrieve some very important documents. He said they contained sensitive information about the participants of the French resistance. These files contained over 300 names. And if they were to fall into the hands of the Gestapo, they would be captured, tortured, and killed. At the time of the discovery of this house of horrors, France was occupied by Nazi Germany. The officers agreed that Maurice Petiot could remove the documents. The thing is that the Petiot that entered the building was not Petiot's brother, Maurice, but rather Marcel Petiot himself. Commissioner George Victor Massou was the chief at the Brigade Criminelle. He was called at his home at 10 p.m., and he knew it wouldn't be good. He was told of the House of Horrors at 22 Le Sur, and he immediately headed over. There was a crowd outside the building, and it was being controlled by the police. Massou was surprised by the crowd because there was a 10 p.m. curfew in place since Nazi Germany occupied France. This mansion was once owned by a princess, so this speaks to its size and opulence. There were 13 furnished rooms, two floors, and a basement. The rooms contained very expensive furniture and items, such as antique furniture, oil paintings, chandeliers, oriental rugs, vases, and marble statues. At the same time, it was unkempt and dirty, 
with items strewn all over the place. Masu was shocked by what he saw. He had seen a lot of terrible things in his career, but nothing like this. The human carnage and the putrid smell that came from the area was something that he could not wrap his head around. Here's a quote from Masu. A foot blackened like a log that had been slowly consumed. A dismembered hand, curled up tightly, grasped the thin air in desperation. A woman's torso with the flesh not away to reveal the splinters of the ribcage. The stench, a sinister odor of roasted human flesh. End of quote. Other items were found, a shovel, a hatchet, and a bag containing the left half of a decomposed body. The head, feet, and internal organs had been removed. The commissioner and principal inspector, Marius Batu, investigated the other rooms of the mansion. One of the rooms appeared to be the doctor's office for his medical practice. The room was clean and tidy, unlike the rest of the house. And it was appointed with all the furnishings, medical equipment, and books that you would expect to see in an office in the 1940s. The investigators found another room, one that would have great significance in the days to come. It also remained a mystery, although there are many theories as to what it was used for. It was a small triangular room, eight feet on the longest side and six feet on the shortest. The walls were thick and soundproof, and one wall was wallpapered. There were no windows or furniture. There were two naked light bulbs hanging from the ceiling in a simple metal cot. There were iron hooks near the corners of each wall. There was a spot on the wallpaper that had a new portion glued on. One of the inspectors pulled back the paper and revealed a viewing lens, about six feet from the ground. It's very possible that this was a torture and kill room. Just outside the room was a false door. It was glued to the wall. And the door in which the officers entered could only be opened from the outside. There was no inner knob. I think this was to make it hard for someone to escape and it would slow them down trying to get out. The inspectors carried on their investigation outside of the building, in the courtyard, at the back of the building. They entered a garage slash old carriage house. At the back of this garage was a sliding door that opened up into another room. And on the ground of that room was a metal cover. Under the cover was an entrance to a pit. The smell that emanated from that hole was horrific. There was no doubt as to what it was. Over the top of the pit was an oiled pulley with a thick rope. At the end of the rope was a hook that could also be used as a noose. The pit was filled with rotting human remains in various states of decay. The bodies were covered in quicklime to speed decomposition. This was the final resting place for up to a hundred human souls. It's very important that I set the stage as to what was going on in Paris and all of France at the time. It was during World War II, and the country was occupied by Nazi Germany, and it greatly affected everyone who lived there, especially the Jewish citizens. It aided the ability of a monster to torture, kill, and murder untold victims. It also stunted and interfered with the police's ability to investigate these horrible crimes. French citizens were leaving en masse. At the time, France had a population of 40 million and about 6 to 10 million people fled. As for Paris, its population was 3 million at the time, and it dropped to 800,000. In fact, the entire government fled on June 9, 1940. Many people in Paris committed suicide rather than live in Nazi-occupied France. The Germans officially occupied France on June 14, 1940. Shortly after that, 200,000 Jewish people began losing their basic civil rights. By October 3rd, they could no longer hold the following positions. Um, the positions in government, publishing, education, journalism, and the military. By 1941, Jewish people could no longer work as bankers or in insurance, real estate, or in hotels. Jewish-owned businesses were seized by the German state. These businesses were given to or sold for a fraction of their worth to non-Jewish people. On May 1941, the Gestapo started to round up. I, I can't, I don't, I hate that round up, but for lack of better words, and arrest Jewish men, women, and children and they were being put on trains destined for Auschwitz-Birkenau. Almost 76,000 Jewish citizens of France were sent to the concentration camps and only 2,600 returned home. The citizens of France, more specifically the Jewish people, were living in terror. And if a non-Jewish person associated or attempted to assist a Jewish person, they were imprisoned, tortured, and sometimes killed. Most of the German soldiers did as they please. They arrested and beat people at will, 
They drank and ate to excess at the restaurants and bars, and they frequented the brothels and engaged in any activity they wished without any consequences. Now that I have set the tone of how horrible and terrifying it was to live in Paris, I will now start to unravel why this is so significant. After investigating Petio's mansion, Massou went home and didn't send any more investigators to the crime scene. Massou was concerned that it was Nazi German soldiers who were responsible for the horrors. The French police were expected to work with the Gestapo and assist them in their agenda. Massou had to report this to the German military before moving forward in the investigation. It seems like the military caught wind of the murders and investigated themselves. They spoke to Massou and told him to find and arrest Petio. The commissioner was now able to fully investigate the house, gather evidence, and start interviewing possible witnesses. When digging into Petio's past, they were discovering many disturbing things, including another murder that Petio most likely committed. Now let's take a look at his childhood. And this is one of my favorite things to delve into, this the whole nature versus nurture. Well, let's get started. Petio was born on January 17, 1897 in Auxerre, France. He was the oldest of two. His brother Maurice was born in December 1906. His father, Félix Irene Moustiol, worked at the post office. His mother, Martha Marie Constance jo Josephine Bourdon, you can tell they're French Catholic, like me, I've got five names too, also, also worked at the post office. His mother died when he was 15 years old in 1912. She died from complications of surgery, though I don't know what kind of surgery. Martha's sister Henriette took care of Marcel and Maurice. In fact, Henriette had been caring for Marcel and later his brother since Marcel was two. Marcel was sadistic and antisocial, as witnessed by neighbors and friends of the family. He'd pull the legs and heads off of insects. He'd capture birds, poke out their eyes, and laugh with glee as they died in pain. He would starve small animals to death and watch them suffer. And he tortured the family cat. His aunt caught him dangling the cat over a pot of hot water one day. And once caught, he pretended to be playing lovingly with the cat. He screamed at his aunt that he hated her and he wished she was dead. Henriette made a big mistake when she gave Marcel a chance to show love to his cat by allowing him to sleep with it. The next morning, when she went into his room, he was covered in scratches and bites and the cat was dead. Petio was very intelligent and displayed this when he was quite young. He was reading at a young age, at a book a day. The books that he was enthusiastically reading were about criminology, police procedure novels, and true crime books about Jack the Ripper and other serial killers. He demonstrated disturbing behavior in school, and he got into a lot of trouble. In grade school, he brought pornography to the classroom, sharing it with his classmates. He would read out loud to his fellow students the sexual escapades of famous people and tell them about taboo subjects such as homosexuality and transgender individuals. Marcel was a loner and he didn't have any friends. Students went along with his monstrous behavior in order to try and escape his vindictiveness. He would bring a knife to school and force a student to put their hand on the table and he would stab him between their fingers. He would also make them stand against the wall while he would throw a knife around them like a circus act. He sometimes brought a gun to school and pretended to shoot cats around the schoolyard. And one time, he pulled out the gun in class and shot into the ceiling. He got expelled. A teacher of his who taught him from the ages of 13 to 16 said he was very intelligent but displayed disturbing and bizarre behavior. In spite of his intelligence, he didn't do well in school. At 17, he was arrested for stealing mail. He admitted to be looking for money and juicy gossip so that he could blackmail people. His father was very angry because he worked at the post office. I don't think that this was a coincidence. Petio demonstrated attention-seeking behaviors. He wanted to be the center of attention. He admitted as an adult that he felt abandoned by his parents. He even believed that his mother cheated on his father and that he was another man's child. He said that he felt lonely, rejected, and unloved. The only person he felt close to was his brother. Petio had been expelled twice from school. So then he was homeschooled by his uncle, a math teacher. Petio joined the army on January 11th, 1916. He trained for 10 months and then joined his countrymen to fight in the filthy trenches of the Western Front. He experienced the horrors of war with the constant bombings and open combat, and the dead and rotting bodies were strewn everywhere. On May 20th, 1917, Petio was injured by a hand grenade that exploded on his foot. It was believed to be self-inflicted, but Petio denied this. 
While in the hospital, he began to show signs of shell shock, now known as PTSD. During the last two years of World War I, Petio spent his time on psych wards and in medical hospitals and even jails for theft. He was caught stealing army supplies and fellow soldiers' personal items. He was also accused of faking mental illness to avoid combat. Petio spent the following three years after the war in various hospitals and mental institutions. He was discharged on July 19th with a full disability pension. One psychiatrist interviewed his family to get his background, and his mother told the doctor that Petio wet the bed until he was approximately 12 years old. His uncle stated that he was intelligent but demonstrated bizarre behaviors. He didn't have any friends. Believe it or not, while he was in hospital, he became a medical student at the University of Paris. The military was paying for it. They were trying to help discharge personnel adjust to civilian life. He graduated after three years with his medical degree. His father was very proud of him and arranged a celebratory party. Petio's demeanor towards the guests was cold and rude, and he left early. Petio opened his first practice when he was 25 years old in the small town of villeneuve sur yon It was approximately 120 kilometers from Paris. The town's physicians were two elderly doctors. Petio advertised to get patients. His pamphlets insulted the other physicians while pointing out his own credentials. This was considered taboo and it didn't sit well with the doctors and some of the townspeople. Regardless, he soon had a flourishing practice. He was very well liked and considered a good listener who showed great kindness and concern towards his patients. Petio was considered a miracle worker by some of his patients, curing previously incurable ailments. He was actually a grifter and a snake oil salesman. He would order concoctions from the pharmacy that were bizarre and dangerous. The ingredients were questionable, and the doses were incredibly high and unsafe. One pharmacist refused to fill his orders. His patients that were elderly, poor, and military veterans were given discounts and sometimes charged no fee. With this flourishing practice, in which he didn't charge or gave a discount price to a lot of his patients, he was able to somehow buy expensive cars and dine at fine restaurants. How was he able to afford these luxuries when he was practically giving his services away? Well, he was signing his patients up for social assistance without their knowledge and being paid directly by the government. Also, some of his patients would pay him with gifts such as fresh produce, eggs, cheese, and little baubles. And he would use people other than his patients for free meals and drinks and other luxuries. Petio developed a friendship with René Nézondé. Excuse my French. Literally, I'm trying to do my best here. A clerk in a small town. René met Petio at an auction, and he describes his immediate liking for the doctor like this. Quote, It was a veritable bewitchment. I could never find the cause of his voiceless attraction that drew me towards him almost despite myself and any rational consideration which would have called for me to stay out of his way. End of quote. Over the next few years, Petio was able to charm, scam, and use many people. They saw him as a charming, well-mannered, and sophisticated man. In 1926, Petio decided to run for mayor and won by a landslide. But Petio's time as mayor was riddled with controversy and ended in disgrace. He had been fired for stealing gas, oil, and electricity. All of these things were very hard to come by post-war. He was also a suspect in the murder of Henriette de Beauve. Petio was rumored to be having an affair with Henriette. Her husband, Armand de Beauve, was the owner of a dairy. He returned home after having a drink at a bistro to find his house on fire. His wife was found dead lying on the kitchen floor with her skull caved in. It was believed that the blows were caused by a hammer, and this hammer was found in a pond nearby the house. It was also believed that the fire was intentionally set probably to cover up the murder. While the fire was raging and the body was found, Petio showed up and drove slowly around the property and was said to be acting strange and nervous. And then the kind, caring doctor left and went to the movies, which you can imagine in that time was completely unacceptable. I mean, it's unacceptable now, but in that time it was noticed and not well received. Also, Henriette and her husband were patients of his. Another person that enters into the arson and murder case was a man by the name of Frasco. Mr. Frasco attempted to blackmail the doctor, saying that he had information that Petio had caused the fire and the murder. Frasco said he would not tell the police in exchange for narcotics. 
and Petio agreed to give him injections of morphine. But after his first injection, Fresco was found dead the next day and diagnosed with a stroke as determined by Petio. Not long after the death of Henriette de Beauve, another ex-lover of Petio's, Louisette Delavaux, went missing. Marcel married Georgette Leblay in 1927. Her father was a restaurant owner in Paris whose patrons were men of influence, politicians, businessmen, and lawyers. Marcel and Georgette had one son named Gerard, and he was born in 1928. Gerard's life was unsettled. He was constantly being moved around between relatives and attended many different schools, and he rarely saw his father. After the horrific discovery at Petio's house of horrors, Gerard was questioned by the commissioner, Massou. He was 16 years old at the time. He admitted that he had been to the house three times, but said it was soon after his father bought the house and it was empty. Later in life, Gerard changed his name and tried to distance himself as far as possible from his family. So now let's get back to 22 Lesur, after the ghastly discoveries. Matu and his investigators had a huge job to do. They had to investigate every inch of the mansion, sift through the remains in the pit, and find Petio. The specialist investigators were asked to sift through the remains, but they refused. Four gravediggers were hired to comb through the remains in the lime pit, a tedious and macabre job and the officers were taking witness reports of what they had seen and heard. So first, they spoke to the concierge. The concierge said that Petio would use his courtyard to enter and leave his house. He would arrive on a bike with a cart attached. The cart would frequently be filled with furniture, paintings, and other items like chandeliers and vases. Then they spoke to Victor Arnell. He was a professor who lived next door at 23 Le Sur, and he said he would hear screaming and cries for help and that it usually occurred between 11 p.m. and 1 a.m., and it was always a woman's voice. Another neighbor said he heard shouting that would keep him up at night, and he would often hear hammering. Other times he would hear a woman's laughter, and then the pop of a champagne bottle, and sometimes the arrival of women in horse-drawn carriages. So you think, why wouldn't they have called the police? Well, it was Nazi-occupied, and you had no idea who that was and what was going on, and people didn't want to get involved. I mean, it could mean their life. Another pile of human remains covered in lime was discovered in the courtyard. This house was starting to unveil all of its secrets. Suitcases were being found filled with possessions like nail files, brushes, and other grooming tools. Other items like shoes and clothing were found scattered here and there around the house. One significant finding was a black satin dress with a dressmaker's tag on the inside. They were hoping to find the designer and trace who owned the dress. Other items with designer names were found in them, like hats and gowns and men's clothing. The cupboards that were found in the basement were filled with even more items. To understand the breadth of these murders, I'm going to read off some of the items that were found. 22 toothbrushes, 22 bottles of perfume, 22 combs, 16 lipsticks, 15 boxes of face powder, 36 tubes of makeup, and other items included scalpels, fingernail files, Mirrors, eyeglasses, cigarette holders, gas masks, umbrellas, and combs. Was he keeping these as trophies? Well, yeah, I think so. Uh, one of the most shocking of these trophies were two jars filled with formalin with penises preserved in them. There was a large amount of prescription drugs and narcotics found, over 500 vials of morphine. Also, peyote, a hallucinogen that was very popular at the time. This was worth a fortune on the black market. Other things of value that were hard to get were coffee, sugar, and chocolate and alcohol. He had stores of them. I'm wondering how he came to have these possessions and all these private items. I have a suspicion. Were these items from his victims? I also believe that Petio was a drug addict. Petio prided himself on being an artist, and his artwork was displayed around his office. It was described as bizarre and diabolical. One such piece was a wooden statue of a beast with a large penis. There were also menacing-looking masks hanging off the wall. Can you imagine going to your doctor's office and seeing something like this? Yeah. <laughs> anyway, coming to an abrupt end here, that's it for today. That was a lot of information, and I cannot wait to tell you the rest of it. I want to thank you guys for listening, and I really, really, really hope that you're doing well as best as we can in these times. I want to thank everybody who leaves a iTunes review and 
I just got one from Ottawa62. Thank you so much. I love, love, love getting these. Yes, I do. And thank you to all the Patreon supporters. It is, you guys help out a ton. And to all you guys who listen, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. I love doing this podcast. I know it keeps me sane and I hope uh, it helps you guys along a little bit. So yes, stay tuned for the next episode. I'm rolling along here, so it shouldn't be too long ahead. And uh, remember to take care of yourselves, take care of one another, and most importantly, love yourself. Peace. One love. Je vois la viande.